Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Horse Geeks podcast, where we look at horses and riding from the inside out. I'm Kirsten Nelson, professional horse trainer, and with me once again is my good friend, Deb Romero, certified Alexander Technique instructor. So today's topic, we've been kind of, in the past few podcasts, we've been going in depth into this research paper and talking about some Oh, paradigm shifting concepts uh, related to bending and lateral bending and lateral work. So we thought we would lighten up a little this week. And we're just <laughs> going to talk about getting too geeky. <clears throat> yeah, it was getting it's getting pretty intense. So we're just going to talk about basic handling and uh, basic handling is everything we do with our horse that we wouldn't call groundwork or we or we wouldn't put in the category of riding or driving or working. So some of some people have grooms that do all the basic handling. Then there's the rest of us who do it ourselves. <laughs> and when I'm either starting young horses or rehabbing horses, it's actually a huge part of the training. <clears throat> yeah. And I've, you know, any barn I've run <clears throat> as a training barn, my staff is trained that this is how we do things in this barn because how a horse is handled and interacting with the human on a day-to-day -day basis really makes a huge difference. I, I know, and I never huge thought difference. of it that way. Now that you bring it up, if, if you're boarding your horse somewhere, most of the time it's somebody else handling your horse. Yeah. And I, I never, that just came up in my head because I'm, you know, everybody's here at my house. I take care of all my horses, but yeah, so that that's something I would really want to know how people are dealing with my horse when I'm not there. Or even and that's something we have no control over. It's if we have to board our horses, we have to pick a good barn. We have to trust right. the staff. We have to trust the barn manager. But in my experience where I've boarded horses in training, especially tricky horses, when I couldn't train the staff or we weren't on the same page because my specialty is dealing with horses that nobody else really wants to deal with. Let's right. just put it that way. So if my staff wasn't supporting how the horse was handled, a lot of the training could kind of unravel because of how they were being handled by people who were not on the same training page. Let's right. just put it that way with more extreme horses. If it's a, you know, if you have a nice riding horse without big issues, where you board probably doesn't make a huge difference. Right. But like your horse, Callie, you know, she was not an easy horse to handle, but no. you never had to board her. Nope. I don't think so. Yeah. Nope. So if you think back to basic handling, because Callie was a horse that you bred, so you've had her since she was born, correct? Right. Okay. She is the one nicknamed Airs Above the Ground. Yeah. She's at least 17 <laughs> hands, big yes. boned. Um, and I'm only 5'1", so yeah. put that, and she's add that up. <laughs> Oldenburg, like premier Oldenburg. She's a, Ver, a Verbon registered Oldenburg, so she is in the German book, not the okay. American book. Yeah. And she is massive she's massive <laughs> and her daddy her sire had a very bad reputation yeah and so and it wasn't his fault it, we can you know we can speak to that it was not his fault uh, well right and I don't want to detour into that rabbit hole yeah. but um I'm just sort of painting the picture that here you are five feet of Welsh fire with this <laughs> 17 hand German warm blood that was also equally full of fire. And of course you named her Caliente because yep. we always pick. <laughs> we know. always pick that. Yeah, Why did I like do that? A chestnut mare named princess is just going to be trouble, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's just going to be trouble. <laughs> so if you think back to when Callie was a baby, Caliente or interactions you had with her. Talk about a basic handling and how, because you had, you had her at home, she was under your care. You right. didn't have other people in the mix. Right. So what were some of the things that came up with just basic handling? 
Well, we've talked about it before. One of her habits is to go into extension, go into that flight mode. She was and quick to do that. Absolutely. Quick to do that. And so whether it's fight or flight, anxiety is flight, tension is fight, ADD, spookiness, can't concentrate, highly alert, all in the flight category, mm -hmm. biting, pinning ears, shoving you out of the way, snarky, ill-tempered, all in the fight category. But those are just two expressions of a horse that feels defensive. Ah. Uh. Right. So the posture you're talking about of the back down and the head and neck up, that's the posture that's instinctually related to the fight and flight um, part of the nervous system. So as soon as the sympathetic nervous system becomes dominant, you're going to get some expression of either fight or flight. And just like us, like Callie had a tendency to a flight defensive pattern. Mm -hmm. There is a horse I've helped a new owner with who had a very strong tendency to the fight defensive pattern, right? So two, and it doesn't mean that a fight horse is aggressive and a flight horse is not, you're not able to catch them, but fight just is a defensive move towards what they're afraid of. So a horse that comes huh. towards us, that's not calm, <laughs> could, <laughs> could be using a fight defensive strategy. And a horse that looks away or moves away <clears throat> is a flight defensive strategy. So we look at the energy, we could just say it's everything but calm, not calm, right? So the quiet one that's pinning their ears and slowly moving in to set you up for a kick, not calm, right? That would be fine with <laughs> things. <laughs> <clears throat> right. And the obvious, like what we think of fear in a horse is the flight defensive pattern, high-headed, right. spooky, taking off, running. But they can have a fight defensive pattern just as easily, just like people. We might gravitate towards flight or fight when we get fearful, <clears throat> but in the right situation, we can switch. True. We're not limited to fight or flight. Yes. So with Callie's flight expression, how did that kind of affect just your day-to-day -day handling of her? Well, it sure could bring up stuff in me that I had to be very careful um, not to go in with the preconceived idea that that's where we were going to end up, you know, that each day is a new day and to go in and just be very aware and listening and watching where is she at? So can you give me an example? <clears throat> um, yeah, when she, she has indicators before what happens happens. <laughs> yeah, they all do. Yeah, before you get to the the airs above the ground horse. Um, yes. She, um, one of her indicators is going into extension. The other one is she blows. She'll okay. do a really hard blow. And that's when I, that is a strong indicator that I'm push I'm pushing buttons, whether good or bad. So what happens to the energy before the blow? and before the head goes up or in conjunction with the head going up. Because if we, if, when we're working with horses, <clears throat> we have words mm -hmm. to choose from, but the real communication behind the word is the energy, the frequency, mm -hmm. the vibration, the tone we use, right? Gives the word specific meaning. And horses have actions instead of words, but the energy right. and the posture or the body language behind the action really is the communication from our horse. Yeah, the, her first clue is distraction. If her she first is clue is not, distraction, yeah. Yeah, if, she, if she's not mm -hmm. eyes on me, ears on me, I, I have to pay attention to that. 
Right. And so when she's distracted from, let's say you walk in the stall and she's eating, what's her energy like? She's pretty calm. Okay. Yeah. Then something happens and you lose her attention. What does the energy do? <clears throat> it just goes everywhere. <laughs> So would you it's say not, it in, it increases or decreases? It slowly increases. Yeah. And I have to make a decision <clears throat> there. Do I do? Is that an, a path we want to go down? Is that healthy? Exactly. Or do I need to backstep and, you know, come up with something else or leave the stall? I mean, I, I think we forget we have a choice to exactly. walk away. Exactly. So we this walk is walk away and go, I'm not organized. This energy is is mixing up with mine and not a healthy way. Let me walk away and take care of myself and come back when I'm in a better appropriate manner. Right. Right. And so I get a bazillion questions <clears throat> about simple basic handling stuff, like taking the horse's temperature feeding issues, feed aggression, giving treats, not giving treats, um, a horse that won't give the feet, right? They keep jerking their feet away. So you can't pick the feet. A horse that's wow. bad with the farrier, a horse that pulls back on the cross ties, um, horses that <clears throat> um, won't pick up one foot or, or snatch it back, right? Or you can't, every time you go to saddle and girth, they turn around to bite or they won't take the bridle. Like all of these things are in the basic handling category to me. Mm -hmm. Or dewormers. It's like giving an oral syringe. Oh my gosh. Right? Things like that. Um, those kind of things become a really big deal in the barn. And it'll get you kicked out of a barn if you board, if your wow. horse becomes dangerous to handle. That makes right? sense. Why, why would people put up with that? Like get your horse trained or find another place because you're putting my staff in jeopardy. Yes. Right. So those poor horses get moved around a lot and the essence behind it, sort of what I was asking you to describe is as humans, the first thing we might notice <clears throat> is the air is above the ground. She blows right. up, she rears, she bucks, she pulls the rope out of your hand. Then you clue in a little bit and you go, now I know this horse. And before she does that, she blows. <gasps> One of those, right? Yeah. Not a good sound. Not usually. <laughs> right. Because then, you know, the blow up comes. Yeah. But if then, I, if I let it escalate, if I let Exactly. So then you noticed, oh, she blows. I better step in now or it's going to be bad. Then when you think about it, you go, what happens before the blow? Oh, she gets distracted. She gets high headed. Right. Yep. And then we took it back a step further. What happened before that? Right. Her energy level changed. And we're just talking energy level because in the sympathetic nervous system, the body is instantly releasing stress hormones. When the parasympathetic nervous system is dominant, we're releasing pleasure hormones. Yes. So we can sort of read which nervous system is becoming dominant moment to moment through energy levels. So that's why I kind of put the word calm with the learning frame of mind or calm as the objective, because those, that sense or that energy is related to the pleasure hormones, which means the horse is probably dominant in the parasympathetic nervous system out of fight and flight. So if we don't have that first step for every problem, somebody asked me about regarding basic handling, it becomes dangerous mm. when we ignore the change of energy level in our horse. And how much, cause I'm just thinking about people going into the stall you know what energy are they bringing to the equation that might right. you know if I've got an agenda and I'm I'm looking at my watch I'm not present to observe what's going on with the horse if 
Right. So therein was the <clears throat> exact difference between when I run my own barn, where it's my support staff, we're all mm -hmm. trained to pay attention, pay attention to the energy as soon as you walk in the barn. Yep. And then we navigate that, the energy level, rather than just getting through the motions of the job of handling the horse. Right. Now, in a boarding barn, not their job. Can't make them do it. Not their job. Right. But <clears throat> we can still work with basic handling in the context of training to help our horse become more self-confident, reduce fear, and be able to cope with whoever is working at the barn that we happen to board at. So we can overtrain our horse to handle a situation with less than perfect people, right? Right. So if we walk in in a mood, if we're in fight or flight, right. just a human being in fight or flight can trigger a prey animal's response, uh, trigger it into fight and flight because we're natural predators, they're natural prey animals. And so if we get into our sympathetic nervous system, that energy can scare a horse, just that energy. I, right? I think and, about it like when the horse looks at something, the horse is going, what was that? And then the human goes, what was that? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Am I supposed to be afraid of that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> are you afraid? afraid? I'm afraid. Are you afraid? I'm afraid. I don't know. I don't know. How do we get out? Who's driving this tugboat? Right? It's like, how do we get out yes. of this? Yeah. Now we're both afraid. Right? Yeah. So it's like run in circles, run in circles, scream and shout. Yes. That's cool. Right. So somebody has to stop that trajectory because it is a quick downhill slide. If the human is in dominance of the fight flight nervous system and the horse is in dominance of the fight flight nervous system, now we have predator instincts dealing with prey animal instincts. Yes. And I go, not cool. Not a good match. No. Nah. Right. So the other issue humans have is just our brain is in the future or the past or we're focused on something and the horse is just in our blind spot. We don't even notice what we don't notice. We're just not paying attention. So if we're not paying attention and we miss those small indicators, yes. then it will escalate to the point that it gets our attention, right? And so I read about that all the time on um, some sites on Facebook about, you know, I didn't see that coming. And I will put in I a didn't, small I caveat. I don't know why my horse bucked me off. Right. You know, and and I like, will put in a very small caveat that that can happen 5% of the time, that something happens okay. so quickly. Okay, 5% of the time, we didn't see it coming. And that's happened to me. 95% of the time, the horse starts to show us an energy change. Yes. It's going the wrong direction. It's going towards fight or flight. It's moving away from calm, content, connected to us, attentive, all of those learning frame of mind things we talked about in that podcast. I think we did a whole podcast on the learning frame of mind. So basically the premise to get our horse safe to handle, and if we need the horse to be so confident that it doesn't matter if the human notices them or not, Right. That's a very self-confident horse that can handle any human putting on the halter, leading them out, picking their feet, you know, things like that. And that's a large percentage of horses. Right. Right. Horses, they can learn that easily when our horse is not that. That's a training opportunity within the category of basic handling. We have to help our horse become confident with the thing that they're not confident about or that defensiveness is going to escalate. And that's not safe for the horse. It's not safe for the human. Right. To let a horse become increasingly defensive in any situation. And I think we talked about it in another podcast, this, this thing we have about if they're afraid of it, take it, take them, get them closer to it. I just posted a lesson on the YouTube channel. It's under Horse Geeks Lessons. And it was about 
overcoming fear for horses and riders. Ah, and it was great because um, this client, I know she's afraid of snakes because she came to visit me, saw a snake, freaked out, right? <laughs> so I go, it's like uh, most humans will have a fear of snakes. I love snakes, but they make me jump when I almost step on one. It's right. automatic, right? And so I said to her, I go, can you imagine if you're afraid of snakes and I'm on the other side of you? And I'm pushing you towards the snake to help you get over it. I said, <laughs> how are you going to feel about me doing that to you? Are you going to trust me? Are you just going to believe me? Are you going to want to see me again? <laughs> right? Because I'm thinking from the horse's perspective, here's the snake, which I'm afraid of. Here's my friend, so-called friend, who's sandwiching <laughs> me, right? Pushing me towards the snake. Now I got a problem on both sides. Yeah. I don't, right? my trust is gone. My trust, trust is shot. And I gone. go, it, it's a great example because I go, I have lots of opportunities with spiders or snakes or a rat in the barn. It's like, okay, human who's afraid of that, I'm going to now shove you towards it until you relax. <laughs> and how do you think that's going to work? It just isn't going to work, right? So that whole thing of obedience or dominance or flooding or desensitization, all of that stuff, I go, not really helpful if you look at it from the horse's perspective. Yeah. I go, would you like that done to you if you had a fear? Do you want somebody pushing you more and more and more into your fear? Right. And I haven't done the research, but I don't know if that's a very popular psychological tool for people. I wouldn't imagine it is. Somebody tried it with wow. me. I would buck and kick and strike and fight. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be like, oh, well, no. <laughs> so even when it comes to like basic handling, like I see people go there with deworming, oral syringes, right? Or a horse that's needle shy, making it worse rather than building confidence. Or a mm -hmm. horse that won't pick up the foot, getting punished for not picking up the foot, which is only creating more fear around the problem that right. you have. And like talking right. about your horse, Callie, you know, I have big horses and I'm not much taller than you. And I go, yeah, that it, it's a losing situation. For yeah. Me. Leverage doesn't work. <laughs> I have the humility to know I am not going to outmuscle this horse. Nope. And I have a lot of leverage tricks and they have still backfired because I go a fearful horse is a massively powerful force. There is no... Yes. And I have seen dealing with difficult horses, there are horses that can bust through massive amounts of leverage. Anything. Yes. Yeah. As long as that horse doesn't feel safe, we are not safe. That's the truth of it. I go, That's even a 300 pound mini, I go, that is still a force to be reckoned with, a 300 pound mini, right? So having a healthy respect like I said to this lady in the lesson, I said, I have a healthy respect for horses power. Yes. I'm not afraid of it. I'd like, but it's like the ocean. I go, if you don't have a healthy respect for the power of the ocean, you're not safe on the ocean. Right. Right. And I think of horses the same way, especially big horses like Callie, they, you better have a healthy respect for all that power or you're in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. So like when it comes to basic handling, to me, I look at it as an opportunity to help my horse reduce defensiveness. And it's, it's not in the context of work, so to speak. So all I'm looking for is energy that's moving towards calmness while we're dealing with the thing that they're fearful about or defensive about. Yeah, I guess I'm that and going back to Callie and the when she blows. So that is, and I never know. I never know if, oh, can if I just change this? Well, you know, it's always a question like what's going to help her? 
Right. And you so don't I have always to have know. many ideas. You know, do I ask for a little bit more? You know, does that push her over the edge? Do I change my, you know, there's a lot of things going on in my head. Like, you know, what do I do next? And then go, how do you know if what you chose to do works or doesn't work? If, if, you, if it's something you should repeat or, or an idea you should abandon, because you're describing it perfectly. We can't control how no. another individual is going to respond or how they feel. So we can make a horse do a lot of things, but we can't make them like it. And we can't make them calm unless we use pharmaceuticals. So right. it's like, <laughs> so, well, for me as an Alexander teacher, the first thing I do is check in with me. Great. So you're not contributing to the problem right. because I, and, yep. you're calm. Yeah. Am I maintaining neutral? Am I being neutral? And I, I think you mentioned this once long, long time ago, because I think as horse owners, we sometimes get enmeshed with our horses. Oh, yes. And yes. you said to me once, and it always sticks with me, ride your own horse like you're the trainer. There, there has to yeah. be there it has ha to be that boundary or or whatever you want to call it. Maybe you can speak to it a little bit better. It becomes when a horse becomes defensive and they start to just like Callie, if so I look at energy in like graduating intensity. Mm, that's so a good way to look so at I go, that, okay, it. zero is a calm horse. And we all know what that feels like and looks like. We all recognize calm. So they're either right. there or they're not, right? If they're not calm, you could have, like you described, the distraction is a mild escalation away from mm -hmm. calm towards anxiety, where my client's horse I talked about who uses the fight strategy, his first sign is kind of pushing into the space, narrowing mm. the eyes, coming a little too close, right? Right. So those would be in the mild categories beginning. It's the beginning of our, of our horse telling us, I'm a little unsure. I'm just right. unsure, right? Then if we do nothing, if we didn't notice it, or if we contribute to it with our own defensiveness, ah. it's going to go from mild right. into moderate. So moderate with Callie is what you described as now the head's up. Now she's uh, d really distracted and maybe right. blowing. Yeah. Right? Blowing is that edge between moderate and extreme. So yeah, that's where I've got to ask the questions. The okay. But there was a lot of stuff that could happen in the moderate area. Right. So like this other horse goes from pinning his ears, a little pushy, nothing bad. You can work around it. And then if she doesn't address it or doesn't take the time to address it, it has escalated into stepping on her, knocking her with his head turning around to bite her or if she's crossing like just and I'm just talking in the cross ties getting oh, wow. to do something right he'll just step on her foot because he's not paying attention right or he goes after a fly and she got her head conked with his head Ugh. right or she's passing in front of him to bring out her tack and he reaches forward and bites her so those would be in the moderate categories right right then you have extreme. And that always gets our attention because now nobody's safe. Right. So that would be the air is above the ground, Callie really acting out. Right. Mm -hmm. Or this other horse um, kicking, making contact with his teeth, pulling back on the cross ties. Um, it, those are the more extreme versions. Right. Right. So if we don't notice it until it becomes extreme, the good news is we go, okay. And that's what, when people say all of a sudden, my horse, blah, blah, blah. And I go, hmm, <laughs> if we trace it back a little bit and you think in hindsight, right. there might've been a more warning signs that are no longer in the extreme category, but they're in the moderate category, right? Or they're in the mild category. 
So when I'm dealing with young horses or rehabbing horses, especially if they have had extreme behavior, what we worked on in the barn, every single person who handled that horse was trained to notice when the horse shifted from zero calm into mild versions of fight or flight. That's way cool. And you take the time to nip it in the bud right there. Yeah. Right. So you go. Because when we go in with an agenda and we ignore that, it's just going to escalate getting to the arena. Yes. Yeah. You know, and we, we get if, in our, like, we have the power mm -hmm. of future thinking. Horses don't. Horses have great memories or they're living in the moment. So they're either going off of past learning, which is as real to them as right now, or the current situation. So if we're not tuned in to the energy fluctuation, right, then we're going to miss the fight or flight warning. Hey, I'm not sure. Hey, friend, I'm concerned. Hello. I'm a little worried about that. Right. So as soon as we see the mild version, if we slow down the pace, take time, pause a little bit, look at what do I need to do to restore calmness in this moment instead of allowing you to move through mild into moderate energy escalation? Yeah. How do I bring this mild energy escalation back down to calm? And that's just, that's the question, right? Then we are individuals, the horse is in an individual. So there's no rules, right? right? There's, there's a lot of strategies and you described it really well. You try this, you try that, you try that. And I go, I got no idea what strategy I'm going to use, but I'm going to use the one that I see my horse responds to by bringing that energy level down towards calmness. Yes. Right. So some horses need more support, more corrections, more boundaries. Other horses need less corrections. They need more space. They need you to take your time, go way slower, right? So that energy level is so important because when defensiveness is increasing, the energy level is going to escalate towards tension or intensity or anxiety, right? right? It's going to go one way or the other. Both are not calm. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't matter if it's fight or flight. They're just not calm, wrong nervous system. Right. Yeah. And I, we, I did a lesson with you on this, but um, I noticed a couple of weeks ago, it's great to have more than one horse. Cause then you can say, well, is it me or is it the horse, you know? And both of my horses would not tune into me. They wouldn't pay attention to me. Under saddle. So, yeah. Under saddle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I couldn't get an ear. They were all distracted. And I thought, well, isn't that interesting? So I decided yeah. to do some lunging for a couple of weeks. Just to that to me was my sign that I needed to change something, something I wasn't on board with something. And how did they respond? Oh, they loved it. I've been lunging for a, a couple of weeks now. But what I've noticed is um, it's almost time to change it again. And so how do you know these things? Like well, because as riders, we say this a lot and some of it can be projection. Some of it can be what we learned. Some of it can be authentic communication from our horses. And that's what I'm talking about because like the principle we're talking about, whether it's riding groundwork or basic right. handling, we need, it, it's a principle that is true for the entire relationship. All the years we have with our horses, this principle mm -hmm will come up in many different ways that we have to reduce defensiveness, restore calmness, help our horse feel safe in all situations. With basic handling, it's the way to get through the dewormer, the needle, the picking up the foot, the teaching them to cross tie, all of the things, you know, leading them in and out, catching them, all of the basic handling stuff. If we just do it in a way that helps our horse become calmer rather than less calm, right? You start to solve the problem. Right. And so that's what I'm getting at is how do how did you know 
that it was working for your horses. Your you changed strategy, so you noticed distraction mm -hmm. and, and unwillingness. You know, just just the simplest of asking a question that I I ask a lot of them. Maybe turn left, whatever, and they just go the other direction. I'm like, what's going on here? This is making right. no sense. So instead of thinking, oh, my horse is in a bad mood, wayward, fighting me, that's where right. people take it personally. Right. My, my horse is working against me. Yes. Right. And, and you didn't take it personally. You became curious to go, they don't normally do this. What's going on? Yeah. And I, I personally, with all the years I've worked with you and the background that I have, I now can say, what do I need to do? Yeah. And that what is do it. I need to do about being the leader here to, to get back, to come down off that level. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Not what does the horse need to do? It's what I need to change. And it's both. It's yeah. both because I also hear riders take on too much guilt, thinking that, yeah. they, that they caused the problem. Hmm. And I go, you didn't cause the problem. Some horses come with the problem. Some right. horses have an innate issue with whatever. Some of it was man-made. Some of it's just who they are. Some of it's personality. But I go, if you respect the horse as an intelligent individual, you can't take responsibility for everything the horse does. Right. Right. It's not a machine. So it's like, no, they have thoughts and feelings. But that in that communication, when they lose calm energy or they don't want to talk to us, they won't yes. look at us. They don't put an ear on us. They're thinking about everything other than being with us. Those are signs that either the cooperation and communication is shut down and possibly a uh, worry, uncertainty, defensiveness, fear-based thoughts, even if it's just instability and uncertainty, they're starting to take a foothold. Right. Right. So as a friend to my horse, if I want to be a friend to my horse, just like I'm a friend with you, when, when we talk on the phone or we visit, our job as friends is to lend support and help each other feel better. Right. You know, that's why we're friends, right. right? And if we put that in our relationship with our horse, we no longer, I, we would not stay friends if I shoved a dewormer down your throat, right? <laughs> Every six months or two months or whatever the program was. Or if you were deathly afraid of needles and I just went, get over it, jab, right? And I didn't right. have any compassion or respect. We wouldn't be friends very long. You would avoid me. Right. Right. And that's how I think of it from the horse's perspective is I go, okay, friend, I see we have a problem. I see you're protecting yourself. So let's work with, you don't have to protect yourself from me. I'm here to help. I'm going to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Yes. Right. So whether that's checking our energy, ego, whatever at the door, mm -hmm. we have to walk into a problem the horse has and think, how can I help rather than, you know, you stupid horse, you're, you should, you should be this. You shouldn't be doing this at this age. You should know better. Why are you doing this to me? Right. And usually when people say, why is my horse doing this? I go, and the rest of the sentence is to <laughs> me. Right. To me. Oh. Because when somebody so people asks are taking me, it personal. Yeah. Uh, most of the time, not all the wow. time. Most of the time. Because, and that's why I said to you, if you pretend it's not your horse, you suddenly take a step back. Yes. Right. And it becomes less personal immediately because not your kid, not your dog, <laughs> not your horse. Right. You can just take a step and gain a little bit better perspective if you pretend this is somebody else's horse that you're being paid to handle. How would you deal yeah. with it? Right. Because that close personal relationship 
we can get into patterns of arguments, like having the same argument with your spouse or your child over and over. We can get into these patterns with our horses. And so if we want to build a relationship with our horse and we want authentic communication, then the first thing we have to do is step in and say, I see you have a problem. How are we going to get through this? Yeah. Right. And, any and I think I think it's important to to um, you might not be able to resolve something with something you used in the past. Right. You might have to get creative. A plus B doesn't necessarily equal C. <laughs> right. No. And everybody else in your boarding barn or your neighbors will come by and offer the solution. Yes. Right. So I take the solution under advisement. But the way I test out what people tell me to do is by simply observing how my horse is responding to this application of any idea whether it was my idea exactly. or my neighbor's idea, yeah. I don't care. But the only way I know it works right now, today, for this particular horse, with all of the history and all the situation, environment, everything taken, factored in, my horse becomes calmer. Right. Then I go, okay, I'm going to use that strategy. Doesn't mean it's going to work for every single horse all the time. But I, and I have broken many of my own rules that way. Yes, so have I. <laughs> right, many of my own rules. And we will, I think at Halloween, we'll talk about treats. That's, that's a big one. I think that's a good one. idea. I think we should talk Tricks about- Tricks and treats. Tricks and treats sometime <laughs> closer to Halloween. But, um, but it, I will explore because the solution to helping my friend, my friend has to tell me, now I feel better. Right. Right. So I might have a friend who says, okay, no matter what I tell you, push me towards the snake. That's what I want. And I go, okay. And we agree upon it ahead of time. Right. And, and right. Then my friend gets through the fear that they wanted to get through, but that was their choice. That's, that I was think their that's choice. A big deal. We forget we have choices that things that may have worked or like I said if I'm not in the right place to handle the situation I've got to deal with me first yes <laughs> yeah and so only if we are authentically calm ourselves yes can we access the frontal cortex part of our brain which is where we have creativity imagination right. conscious control so if we're going into fight or flight it's not going to end well for us or our horse. And it's certainly, it's going to be a big fat fight with our horse. Yes. You know, just like with our spouse, with our kids, sometimes it goes there, no blame, but right. doesn't strengthen the relationship. It, it sort of takes away from the relationship. Right. Every time that happens, it's something that takes some time to recover from. Where if we had a good friend who is helping us through fears, we might take little tiny steps depending on like, if, if I'm the one who needs help and I'm afraid of something, I might prefer, let's just dip our toe in the water today and that's enough for me. Like right. I can't handle any more than that, right? Or I might go, oh, that wasn't so bad. Yeah, I could do more, right? And then I might hit a personal threshold where I'm letting you know, this is too much for me right now. Right. And if you don't listen to my words, my anxiety, my tension is going to start bubbling up, whether I'm a human or a horse. Right. So I find that threshold by really watching the energy and the body language of my horse more than what they're doing. Uh, give me an example. What do you mean more than what they're doing? So, okay, so I have a client who's having trouble picking up one, the left front foot on her horse, needs to pick the feet, right? We, that's right. A, it's something we have to do, but it was becoming an argument every single time she had to pick up the left front foot, right? So 
what we could do is get ropes, use leverage, make him hold it up, drug him. We could do workarounds all over the place and get the left right. foot picked up. But I go, this is a daily basic handle handling routine right. for the health of the horse. It's important, right? So this horse, when you went to pick up the left foot, instantly his energy level went up. Ah. So he's obviously had a bad experience related to holding that foot up. So number one, I'm going to read that energy escalation and go, do I really need to pick up the foot right now? It's a good one. Maybe I go to the other three, leave that one. Maybe we go take a little walk and come back and then try it again. But I'm going to find a strategy that as soon as I go to pick up the foot, if his energy, if he's already losing calmness right there, that tells me, okay, I need to make him feel better about this idea, not worse. Yes. It's so, I, yeah. Okay. I'm going to try sense. a bunch of different strategies. I got no idea what's going to work, but I, it doesn't just because he got defensive, our human tendency is, well, now I have to do it. I now know. it's an obedience thing. Ugh. I can't let him get away with it. It'll only get worse if I let him get away with it. And all of that way of thinking is what starts that energy escalation from mild to moderate to extreme. It just yes. goes bing in from zero to 60. If we think instead, oh, my friend is telling me he feels unsure, uncomfortable, mm, telling me not to go here. But it's like kids. This is necessary. I'm sorry you don't like it, but this is like a necessary part of life. So then we look at how can we first just get the energy calm, Good right? Point. So then if I reach for the foot and the energy is calm, I could try picking it up. If I get the foot up and then the energy level shoots up, I might put the foot right back down. Right. Yeah. So some horses, when I pick up a foot, they lose their balance or they're uncomfortable physically. So they're perfectly calm, but they rip the foot out of my hand. Right. I go, that's different than a defensive horse. Right. That, that's a horse who's willing to work with me, but they're not good at it for one reason or another. But it's not scaring them to pick up the foot. Right. I just I have to repeat it until they get good at it as a skill. But number one, if they're afraid of it, they're never going to get good at it. Right. Right. So I have to get them to be to trust. Right. Trust is really the solution. I go, if your horse trusts that you have their best interest in mind, they can learn all kinds of things that challenge horses. Yes. Even, even you know, veterinary treatment, farrier treatments, some things we have to do with our horses are never going to be comfortable, nice things to do. Right. They're just, it's never nice to get a needle stuck in your body. I right? agree with that. So, but can they handle it? Right. Yes, they can handle it. They can handle momentary discomfort if they trust us and if they feel safe. Yeah. So that's like all the basic and same with dewormers. I have solved more deworming issues by just holding the dewormer until the horse became calm enough that I could even start to get near them. I think it's as the human in the Alexander community, we are, our main problem is we're end gainers. We want to accomplish the task and we don't think about how we are accomplishing the task. Ah, so horses are great Alexander Technique instructors. They are. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter to the horse what you do. It matters very much how they feel while they yes. do what they do. Yes. And as soon as that energy level is losing the, the calmness, and I'm not saying you want a dead calm horse all the time. They can be a little distracted. They can be a little excited, but it, it, it's that sort of, when they go into the sympathetic nervous system, it's a different kind of energy. Yeah, it is. We it's, feel it's it. It's tense. It feels like tension maybe. Yeah. I don't know. And for a lot of people, we get a little butterfly flitting around in our Ooh. stomach when our horse goes That's there. A good one. 
because our body recognizes it, even if our brain doesn't. Exactly. Our body recognizes that energy of fear or uncertainty because we start to react to it even before we've consciously gone through the process. Yeah. Yeah. So I look at the long-term solution because I never tell people, they say, how long is this going to take? I say, I got no idea. Right. I got no idea because you're talking a relationship. This is between you and your horse. Your horse is going to respond how he's going to respond until he feels safe and trusts you and can cope with this little bit of discomfort. And if you lose your temper in the process, you're only slowing yourself down. Yeah. If you punish or demand obedience, you're probably not going to get there very fast. I can say <laughs> that with Callie trying to get her on a horse trailer. How do you get, how do you force a 17 hand, 1300 pound horse to get in a horse trailer? I don't know. And there are a lot of techniques. I will say that because yeah. somebody might comment, oh, I've got blah, 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 blah strategy. And I go, the problem is if you put a scared horse in a trailer, yes, they can go in the manger, through the front bar, out the escape door, break the yep. butt bar, kick the door out, take out windows. I mean, they can do all kinds of things if they're afraid in the trailer. Exactly. So I actually even put trailer loading in the basic handling category. Oh, good. Yeah. No, and I have, I should mention, I did a workbook. It's a very simple workbook called Basic Handling. And it goes through all of like the learning frame of mind concept and all of these different things that we have to deal with in basic handling and how to get horses through it. So that's on my website. I'll put the information below, but there is a printed book just on this topic that might be helpful if this is a big deal for anybody who's listening. Because it can be so frustrating. It can be yeah. so, and when I worked with horse rescues, I said, you know, a horse that's hard to handle on a daily basis is not the horse that gets kept. That's, that's the horse point. that gets sold. That's the horse that has to move a lot or have new owners a lot. So the kindest thing we can do for our horse is resolve the basic handling issues for that horse to at least have a happy life. Right. Right. With That's humans. Yeah. With humans. Right. So even if the horse is going into retirement or even if the horse doesn't really have a job, it's like you still have to do farrier care, vet care. Right. You have to take care of the feet. You have to take care of the teeth. Like you can't do nothing. You have to feed them. You might have to like, even if they have a run in and out and fully full access to shelter, it's like you still got to clean up after them. You got to fix fences. Right. You got to do stuff. So, so in a nutshell, it's like a friend is going to help you reduce defensiveness, at least with you. Right. Right. Then you build the relationship by helping your friend overcome challenges. You don't avoid in the way that, that works for, <clears throat> in the way that works for them in a way that works for them. And yeah. they have to constantly tell us. So if I'm trying a strategy and the horse is becoming more anxious and more tense, I go, oh, that's not going to work. Let me try something else. Yeah. And that's what you're describing, what you learned with Callie or even what you're describing with your horses. You go, huh, they're not paying attention. They're not communicating with me like they normally do under saddle. Maybe I should try something else. Yeah, yeah, and you, exactly. And you tried lunging. And then the calm attention came back. Yeah. So you go, ah, okay, this is what they wanted. Right. Right. If it didn't, try something else. Right. Because they're going to tell us, the horses tell us what works for them by feeling safe, feeling better, becoming more cooperative. And wanting to be with us. I mean, my horse is actually, you know, it's like, pick me first, pick me yeah. first. Yeah. <laughs> And that that's what I want. And yeah. it's not about treats. You it's, will never get about... that. You will never get that through condition response. You will never get that through obedience training. You will never get that through dominance and submission. Exactly. Only, only through authentic friendship with your horse. Right. right? And a lot of times what, what will guide us is if you literally put yourself in your horse's horseshoes 
and you think, would I want to be treated that way? Right? It's not always the way that the horse wants to be treated, but we go, okay, I can start there and see if I did it with a way that would work for me, how does my horse respond? Yes. And then the horse says, hey, that works for me too. Or no, not so much. You better find something else. That's not working. I'm just going to keep on escalating. <laughs> <laughs> so I think anything you want to add to that? Like Callie was just such a great example because yeah, really. I go big, powerful horse, small person. <laughs> if you're not working with her internal, her internal yes. sense of safety, which has nothing to do with, with the environment, with I anything. agree has nothing to do with anything other than they trust us. Yes, because now she's gotten to the point that, you know, I was, this was a while back, I was riding, the UPS truck comes screaming up the road, the dogs are chasing the UPS truck, and she is right there with me. That, Ignoring that. She's that. like, I don't need that. I'm right here. We're doing, this is great. This friendship's really working. I want to stay here with you. Yes. And I was like, yes. Yes. And that, that feels so good. What a moment where you're like, it was. Blue, blue ribbon moment for, it was. for her. <laughs> in our book. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, you guys, thank you for joining us for another Horse Geeks podcast episode. Um, and just a recap, basic handling all of these things we have to do that are not necessarily nice things like needles and deworming and things like that. Um, think in terms of building trust, calming energies, and being a friend. And you will find your way. You will find yes. your unique way with your horse based on what your horse is telling you more than any horse professional is telling you. I agree with that. And this is really talking about from the inside out, like that's like our tagline for the podcast. It. And this is a great example of really working with how the horse is feeling on the inside in the context of having to deal with something that's unpleasant. Yes. But unpleasant doesn't have to create fear. It can just right. be unpleasant. Yep. <laughs> All right, you guys, thanks right. again for joining us. Please like, share, subscribe, and we will see you next time on the next episode. Bye, everybody. Bye.